All right, greetings, folks. Uh, I hope you're all having an excellent time at uh, Virtual Narcon 2023, and hopefully you're hearing me. I will start um, uh, sharing my slide set with you now. And uh, uh, just remember, please ask any uh, questions at the Q&A on the end. Unfortunately, I can't, um, uh, when I'm showing the slides, it's tough to see the chat and the Q&A. So, um, so we'll save that stuff at the end. Anyway, uh, welcome to a uh, sort of getting started with radio, radio tracking talk. Um, I'm really going to focus mostly on uh, systems enabled with GPS and, and telemetry. I'm Will Marchant. Um, my amateur radio call sign here is KW4WZ. Uh, give me a second. I'm just going to turn on the laser pointer. That might be a little bit easier for people to see. Uh, feel free to send me um, questions if you'd like. And then if you go to the website, I have uh, slides up from previous Narcons, and I have some information about GPS uh, tracking systems for model rocketry. Uh, my background is in computer science. I work for the Space Sciences Laboratory at the University of California, Berkeley. I live in Northern Virginia, um, but I work uh, full time for UC Berkeley. That's the view out over the San Francisco Bay from our lab uh, up at the 1300 foot level of the, uh, the Berkeley Hills. Um, lucky enough, I've gotten to work on some, some cool projects. This is Orpheus Spas. Uh, Bill and I were uh, out doing some work on that before it flew on Space Shuttle Discovery. Uh, the last two missions I've worked on have flown on the Pegasus rocket. That's um, this air-launched rocket. It's flown 40 or 50 times since it first flew in the early uh, 1990s. And um, it was fun being able to work on the uh, control systems uh, on board the aircraft. Sadly, I wasn't able to fly in the aircraft when uh, during the actual launch flights, but I spent a lot of hours on the uh, a crew deck working with the uh, with our satellites uh, in the front end of the Pegasus. Uh, currently working on SphereX, which is a Caltech JPL astrophysics origins of the universe mission. Uh, I'm working on uh, Tracers, which is a two spacecraft constellation doing space weather stuff. And that's actually apropos of, of GPS. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then uh, I'm spending some time on the Enceladus Organic Analyzer, which is a really fun little project. It's a uh, micro miniature chemistry lab that we're hoping to fly through the um, ice plumes of the volcanoes at the poles of um, the icy moon Enceladus to look for, for signs of life. So I'm really enjoying that quite a bit. Uh, I like all different sizes of rockets. I usually fly with Novar here in Northern Virginia. Uh, sometimes fly with VAST um, or NARHAMS, and um, we'll get into radio tracking. Thanks for patience while I got uh, over that the introductory stuff. So uh, tracking your rocket, uh, you, you basically have three options. Well, maybe there are four options. So the, the first option is, is eyesight, just keeping an eye on the rocket and seeing where the thing lands. And you really need to do that in spite of all the radio tracking stuff if you can't, because radio tracking isn't a, isn't a magic bullet. It doesn't always work. And if you can, you want to see where your rocket lands. You want to um, pick a spot on the horizon. Um, you want to know where you are. And then if you know, have a spot on the horizon that's in line with where the rocket landed, you can always you know, walk to it. Um, the, the fourth um, rocket recovery technique that you don't want to use is getting it back from the farmer after it's been you know, harvested when the corn or the crop comes down. But the middle two are, are more interesting. And one is um, RDF, radio direction finding. And you can see this um, fish and wildlife um, person there tracking wildlife using a directional antenna. And so basically you put a very simple transmitter that beeps um, frequently at some rate on the object that you want to track. And then that antenna um, has directional sensitivity. So when you're pointed directly at the beep, it's loud. When you're pointed away or opposite of the beep, um, it gets uh, quieter or maybe you can't hear it at all. And so you can triangulate by going to a couple of locations. We aren't going to spend much time in this talk talking about RDF. 
What we are going to talk about is um, telemetry, where you have an onboard system that calculates where the rocket is, sends that data down to the ground, and then you use that to, to go to the rocket's location. We'll talk a little bit about transmit frequencies because it, it is important. Um, the commercial systems that we'll mention later, those typically use cell phone um, uh, for the, to transmit the data. And cell phone isn't terribly reliable out where we fly a lot of our rockets. Um, there are um, non-licensed commercial systems that you can use, and then there is amateur radio spectrum. And, Amateur radio operators are sometimes called ham radio operators. So that's, um, and ham is shorter than saying amateur radio service. So um, there's a decision about whether to use ham stuff or not to use ham stuff. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then one thing to think about is, um, is spread spectrum. So that's basically the technology that's used to transmit the data. And some spread spectrum techniques are extremely difficult for you to um, do direction finding on. But some uh, of the uh, commercial and, and basically all the amateur radio uh, telemetry transmitting services, you can do radio direction finding. And I think that's a big advantage because if you if your rocket lands in a ditch or something and you can hear it faintly, but not loudly enough to decommutate the data to get, you know, the latitude and longitude, you can still do DF to get close enough to get a good reading. Okay, um, sorry, a, a little bit of a map refresher here. When you're using telemetry, um, that data comes back typically as, as latitudes and longitudes. And so latitude is, is degrees north or south of the equator, right? And then longitude is degrees east of or west of this reference point, um, you know, this uh, prime meridian, which goes through through Greenwich, England. When these numbers are expressed, uh, remember the east is typically a positive number and west is typically a negative number. And we'll look at this later. And then not all latitudes and longitudes are the same. You know, it's the wonderful thing about standards, right? There are so many of them. Um, I have a slide up here about um, Dr. Gladys West, who in the 60s did a lot of the uh, fundamental research on the, the geodetic datums, the coordinate systems that are used in the GPS system. And she's an amazing person. She's still around. Um, and uh, there's a great Wikipedia article about her and her career. And I encourage you to go and, um, and look that up. So uh, uh, World Geodetic System 84 is uh, the number numbering system that's typically used for latitude and longitude um, in your GPS receivers. But you can change that. And so you need to be a little bit careful to make sure that your GPS system is transmitting WGS84 coordinates and that your receiving ground station is expecting stuff in WGS84 so that the numbers are consistent. Topographic maps, um, paper maps, which you still may want to use, you know, if you don't have good cell phone coverage out at your uh, launch site, uh, Google Maps, Apple Maps, those may not work. Um, there are standalone mapping systems where you can download maps and Google Maps, for example, will let you download maps uh, into your, um, uh, into your uh, cell phone so that it, it'll work offline. But you need to remember how to do that. Uh, paper maps are always a good backup, um, but the topographic maps um, are often um, have coordinates in a uh, different geodetic uh, datum. And uh, North American datum 27 and North American datum 83 are not uncommon things to see on the labels at the bottom of your topographic map. And so then you need to be a little bit careful because some of these things can be off by a couple hundred feet. Maybe that doesn't matter for rocketry, but it can matter if you're, you're trying to take your oil tanker into harbor at night or in bad weather, um, there have been some issues with mismatches in, in datum settings. And so you, you don't want to be that person. OK, so latitudes and longitudes when you're doing GPS stuff, is th they're standards. There are a few different ones, actually. Um, 
here's a Google Maps image of the Valley Aerospace team launch a little bit um, south of me in, in Virginia. It's a lovely field. If you get a chance to fly there, I encourage you to go down there and visit with these, those folks. There are basically three different um, uh, latitude, longitude coordinate systems that you're likely to come across. There's degrees, minutes, and seconds. And so degrees, a 60th of a degree is a minute, and then a 60th of a minute is a second. And then whether you're north or south of the equator and whether you're west or east of that prime meridian in um, Greenwich, England. A common format is to do completely decimal degrees. And so if you take 34.1 and divide it by 60 and add it to 22, and then you take that and divide it by 60 and then um, add it to 38, you'll get this 38.376139 number. Um, this is convenient because if you cut and paste this number into the search field in Google Maps in exactly this format with no extra spaces or anything, It'll, it'll take you to this location. So that's pretty cool. The other thing you often see in um, GPS units often spit out data in this thing called NEMA format, National Marine Electronics Association. It's a, um, it's a standard for interchanging uh, information inside uh, navigation and, and various other systems on boats. And it's commonly used in, in navigation systems. And most GPS receivers actually spit stuff out in a, in a NEMA format. That very commonly does degrees and then minutes. And, and when NEMA displays it, it runs all this stuff together. So there are no commas or anything. So you need to be careful to make sure that you don't just take this a number like this and try and plug it into a system that's expecting a number like this, because sometimes they don't complain and they do weird things, just a heads up. All right, so what, what can you use GPS for, the global positioning system? I've been talking about um, that for a little bit. Well, obviously, um, for tracking stuff, um, you use it for onboard logging of data. Uh, that's pretty common if you're flying a science payload. Uh, the spacecraft that I work on these days, basically all of them have a GPS receiver. Dual deploy. Probably not so much. We'll talk about how the um, the altitude readings from from GPS is is not really all that good. Um, research for non rocketry stuff. Um, GPS is basically sending radio signals through the ionosphere, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So when the ionosphere changes, the GPS signals change, and you can use that to actually figure out what's going on in in the ionosphere. And basically every uh, a uh, drone these days, you know, the quadcopters or whatever uses GPS on board for flight and sometimes attitude control data. Um, I love this photo. This is a GPS controlled payload system that the military uses. So they can plug in a spot on the earth and they can, um, this system will automatically steer itself to a landing. All right. So I've been yapping on about GPS. What is GPS? It's, um, the global positioning system, it's cut, these things are sometimes called um, global navigation satellite systems, GNSS. Uh, the US military calls RGPS NavStar. And the way it works is um, you have a receiver. This one is shown on the surface of the earth and it listens to the satellites above its horizon and by uh, knowing the time, you can calculate the time that that the signals are transmitted from these GPS satellites to when it's received on the ground. The receiver does a calculation and it's basically triangulates by the receiving time where it is on the surface of the Earth or, or above the Earth. So the cool thing about this is it's satellite-based and it's global, um, and it's a free service. You've, you've paid for it with your taxes, so I guess it's not really free. But um, there's not any uh, ancillary costs associated with that. And what your receiver will calculate is um, a an incredibly precise time, um, position, and then also velocity, which is very interesting. GPS is receive only. That was a, a requirement for the military. They didn't want their ground 
assets to have to be transmitting because that was seen as a possible danger. It's split up. There's um, military capabilities that give much higher precision than the civilian subset of data. We can go into that later if anybody's curious. The other interesting thing is that, and I, I guess it makes sense that uh, a lot of foreign governments and foreign organizations were worried about uh, depending upon a US military controlled system uh, in case there were hostilities, they thought that the system might go away. So most of, uh, so a lot of other countries have um, implemented their own satellite constellations and they these are basically all interoperable. So the receivers these days typically know how to uh, receive signals from the GLONASS, which is the Russian constellation of satellites, Galileo, which is a European constellation, and Baidu, which is the Chinese constellation. And so it basically gives four times as many satellites to try and, and optimize the, uh, the position readings. Uh, GPS really got started because there was a need for precision targeting of weapons. Um, uh, submarines and aircraft move around, and so um, they need to know where they're launching or, or dropping uh, weapons from in order to know where those things are going to be, uh, are going to impact. Um, there were a lot of earlier systems, um, celestial navigation, where, uh, where the systems would look at the stars to figure out where, um, where the aircraft or submarine or, or ship was. Uh, there are some radio navigation systems that are still uh, in use, and we'll talk about those in a moment. And then there were some early satellite navigation systems that have, have basically gone away and been replaced by uh, GPS. It's been around for quite a while, about 40 years now. So um, uh, younger folks in the audience won't remember a time before GPS. But uh, when I was doing mountain search and rescue stuff, we didn't have GPS assets. And so we were really dependent upon uh, paper maps, uh, compasses, and using altimeters um, to uh, uh, figure out where we were on um, on paper maps. So GPS is a lot easier as, as long as it works. Um, paper maps, of course, don't depend on batteries and, and good signals and things like that. So I encourage people to still be familiar with, with paper maps. GPS satellites are about halfway out to geostationary orbit. Um, Iridium satellites, were the, which are the uh, communication satellites, are much lower. Um, they do that to try and reduce the size of the antennas on the, on the hand units. Um, the disadvantage is that you need uh, vastly more satellites in order to uh, cover uh, the Earth because their field of view is much less than the uh, the satellites out here in the GPS orbit. Geostationary orbit is really nice, of course, because um, as long as your orbit is, is uh, over the equator and not tilted with reference to the equator, then you can have a fixed antenna on the surface of the Earth and um, point it at, a sat at the uh, geostationary satellite to receive television pictures and things like that. And you don't have to move it. That's a big advantage there. Okay. GPS limitations. I, I love this graph because it, it talks about some of the earlier um, navigation systems. Actually, um, the VOR stuff is still used in aircraft these days, although it's it's tending to, uh, to disappear. Um, the inertial nav stuff is interesting. So uh, early navigation systems just depended on keeping track of of direction changes and um, acceleration changes to try and guess where you were. A lot of GPS receivers will still do that. Um, and there have been a couple of notable um, boating accidents, including some, some very large ships who have run aground because their GPS antennas broke. And the people um, doing the navigation didn't notice because they were still getting uh, solutions um, and they're, you know, dead reckoning uh, solutions from the GPS receivers that over the course of a day or two drifted enough that um, they ran aground. Uh, so don't be the person that does that. Um, Loran is still being used. That's a, um, uh, a World War I, World War II system. There's a new generation of it that came in after World War II that gives you pretty good accuracy, you know, 100, 200 meters um, over long range. 
and it's uh, it's less easy to jam than the GPS stuff. So there's some talk about keeping Loran around because you can, in fact, uh, either jam or uh, spoof the GPS stuff. That'll give you, you know, you can usually do better than nine meters. You know, five or six meters is usually good. So so 15 or 20 feet to get a GPS reading is is not too bad. There are accuracy issues with GPS, though. I mentioned selective availability. That um, was a capability that the military put in to degrade the readings that civilian receivers would produce. That's been turned off for a while. Um, I don't know if they can still turn that on again, um, but uh, I just mentioned it so that you've, you've heard about it. We talked about space weather and how that can affect GPS accuracy. And um, that's part of the reason why we do space weather missions like, um, like tracers to try and get a better handle on predicting what the ionosphere um, does and is going to do so that you can then figure out if your medevac helicopter mission needs to be delayed because GPS is going to be giving you uh, crummy solutions or whatever. The other thing that's, um, that's not immediately obvious is that the uh, the geometry of the GPS constellation. So those satellites are, are constantly moving and some of them will be down on the horizon and some of them will be up overhead. Uh, people doing high accuracy surveying for things like highways or buildings or whatever, they'll often um, look ahead at the time of day, see where the satellites are gonna be and then pick which satellites they wanna use to make uh, very precise surveying readings to try and get down to a very uh, a very precise accuracy. There's a uh, another thing called WAS, the Wide Area Augmentation System, that is um, gets data broadcast from satellites or from ground stations that um, has some information about what the ionosphere is doing. And so your receiver, um, if it's WAS enabled, W A A S will listen to that data and it'll try and improve its position calculation um, based on the space weather information that you're getting. Another thing that's not necessarily obvious is, um, is signal blockage stuff. We'll talk about that a little bit, but there's one particular one multipath that's probably not gonna be an issue for rocketry, but I, I'll mention it because um, it's a real issue if you're driving in cities, um, urban canyons, or even if you're at the bottom of real canyons where the radio signals can bounce off the walls of canyons and um, the, the precision of the navigation solution is really dependent upon that signal um, coming straight from the satellite down to you. And if it's bouncing around in between buildings and then gets to you, it's gonna introduce errors. Probably not a rock tree thing. You better not be flying in downtown, um, but I mention it because it is a car navigation issue. All right. Um, I guess, I, you know, I want to say it, but um, if you're going to be using your GPS to do radio tracking stuff, you need to make sure that your telemetry is working. And we'll talk about that um, a little bit more. It's always good to have a backup of being able to use a, a, a gained antenna like a Yagi um, to point you in the direction of your rocket so that if you lose telemetry, you have a chance of getting close enough that you can start decommutating packets again. So you wanna keep that in mind. There are some limitations built into the GPS, the civilian stuff to keep it from being weaponized. And so um, it's pretty common that, uh, that the receiver will start doing weird stuff at about 18 kilometers of altitude. And if you get up to a, a fairly high speed, Sometimes the receivers, you know, you can, for civilian use, you can get uh, balloon enabled receivers that will still give you um, a, a good position reading at high altitudes, like 100,000 feet for your uh, amateur radio balloon that's going at low speeds up there. But um, uh, some receivers, and it's tough to know what it's gonna do until you actually try flying. You know, some of them will get, up above one or both of these limits, and then they'll uh, slow down or uh, even stop giving you solutions. So um, if you're trying one of these 100,000 foot flights, you need to do some research on your system and make sure that it's, that it's actually gonna uh, perform the way you want at um, altitude and speed. 
The other thing that the GPS receivers have problems with is a thing called jerk. And so that's, um, you know, constant acceleration is usually not much of an issue, but changes in acceleration can cause the GPS receiver to lose lock. And so that's something to keep in mind for high performance flights. All right. So um, what do you need to do one of these GPS enabled tracking systems? Well, there's a there's a space segment that you don't really have to worry about because you, you're hopefully paying your taxes and it's being it's being paid for by various governments and stuff. But um, uh, your airborne segment, the stuff you need to fly. Um, remember, you need a battery that's going to stay connected. I, I felt a little bit silly about saying this, but you know you do need for all your altimeters, especially dual deploy ones and things like that. Make sure you understand how your batteries are. I'm constrained in the rocket so that they don't move and don't tear loose. You have enough charge, um, things like that. You typically need a, a, a GPS receiver on board the rocket to receive signals from the satellite and generate latitude, longitude, altitude data that will go to a telemetry transmitter. And then um, that needs an antenna that can transmit the data to the ground. And we'll we'll talk about some some issues with that. And then you need to be able to do something with that data on the ground. You need an antenna that can receive that signal. You need to be able to decode the data. And in minimum, you need that antenna telemetry receiver, a good battery system so that your ground station continues to work when you're trying to track your rocket. Don't neglect this battery. And then at minimum, you need a display so of some sort so that you can look at that telemetry data and at least get latitude and longitude so that you can plug that into a mapping app to go there or look at it on a paper map. But a lot of the um, ground segments will also have their own GPS receiver so that they know where you are and they can then give you a range and bearing to the airborne segment. And a lot of them also have a compass on board so that they know which direction you're pointing so that you can get a relative bearing and it'll tell you to steer left or steer right um, to go to your rocket. But those are sort of optional stuff and you can um, keep costs down by not having that. And then de uh, depending on stuff in for your cell phone, for example, uh, to supply that capability. Some things you should keep in mind when you're doing this. The firmware, the software that lives inside these GPS receivers often has different modes. And there's typically an automobile mode, you know, that's designed to optimize the performance of the receiver when it's being driven around on the ground. And then there's typically an airplane mode that's optimized, um, you know, that, that will optimize the receiver's behavior for um, flight modes. Check with your vendor. They'll probably be setting this automatically, but it's worth asking. You need to be able to transmit that. You need Well, the, the GPS receiver needs to be able to receive the signals from the satellites, and then you need to be able to transmit that telemetry to the ground. And so you need to be careful about where you're going to be putting stuff inside your rocket to make sure that the uh, that the materials aren't uh, radio frequency opaque, that they aren't going to um, uh, block the signals like uh, uh, carbon composites might, or if you have stuff inside of a, uh, uh, if there's some aluminum structure like rebar um, to your avionics bay, you might want to be a little bit careful about that. There are different types of GPS antennas, um, and they'll have different um, fields of view where they can receive signals. And you want to pay attention to that a little bit because um, you don't want to bury your antenna so that um, it's going to be pointing at the ground when your rocket is uh, coming down on its flight. That's probably the time when you want the telemetry the most is when your rocket is hopefully drifting down under a, uh, a, a nice parachute. And then a lot of manufacturers recommend sort of soft mounts like wrapping your, your GPS system in bubble wrap to try and minimize jerk. Um, I haven't done any experiments with that. I, I 
typically do that as a matter of practice. Um, I think this could be a really interesting um, NARAM science fair project to, um, uh, to try and study that. All right, there are lots of different frequency bands we can use for getting uh, data down to the ground. And uh, uh, a very common one is this two meter, 145 megahertz uh, amateur radio band. Uh, there's this uh, 200 megahertz wildlife tracking band. Um, this is uh, often used for like Walston systems and things that come uh, we, that uh, get used by um, things like the hawking community, people who use um, birds of prey to, to do hunting. There's a not very often used ham band um, at uh, 200 megahertz, the um, alpha communications, uh, and I, I'm not sure that they're in business anymore, um, typically use this. You needed an amateur radio um, uh, license to use this, and they would get a, a call sign from you before they would sell you a transmitter. The common handband stuff for, for tracking um, is the uh, 70 centimeter, 440 megahertz handband. That's um, Altus, Altus Metrum, Big Red B, some of the other folks typically use that. Although there is an unlicensed um, frequency in, uh, in the 70 centimeter handband. So you can, get, you can get some unlicensed systems there. And then there are some, some unlicensed uh, 900 megahertz stuff. Big Red B has got a, a GPS system that's basically analogous to their um, 70 centimeter and two meter systems that works in the unlicensed 900. And then there's a lot of, uh, of Wi-Fi spread spectrum stuff and the, the do-it-yourself system I'll talk about in a couple minutes uses, um, uses that Wi-Fi frequency spectrum. I mentioned cell phone earlier. You can buy a lot of, um, of GPS tracking stuff for cell phones. Um, you often have to buy a plan, uh, a monthly cell phone plan. Some of those you can cancel and just, you know, do the month that you want to use it in. But you need to be a little bit careful because you need to have good cell phone coverage for that. So just, you know, do your homework. Um, commercial systems using proprietary hardware. Uh, proprietary protocols for sending the data down. Uh, there's lots of hardware out there. Um, you aren't supposed to use that stuff on amateur radio frequencies. All the amateur radio stuff is supposed to be um, open source. Probably the most frequent amateur radio uh, protocol for use in this tracking stuff is uh, APRS, the Automatic um, Packet Reporting System. There's a standard allocation at 144.39 megahertz in the USA, and you can see a map over here. Um, people around the country have um, implemented receiving systems that will listen to uh, position packets from your handheld radio, your rocket, your um, high altitude balloon, and then they'll put that out in databases on the uh, on the internet, and you can um, you can see where where these various things are. Um, there are also a couple of handheld amateur radios that um, know about the APRS protocol. Uh, this is the Yaesu FT5DR. Um, I've got one of these. It's a really nice radio. It'll listen on two meters or 70 centimeters to this APRS stuff. It's got GPS on board. It'll tell you the, the range and bearing to your, um, to your rocket just with this. Um, I don't know if you can see it with this little handheld radio. So this is the only thing you need as a ground station um, if you want. All right, so current products. We talked about the consumer stuff. I'm not convinced that that's really all that good. You know, the dog tracking systems, you know, with collars for keeping track of your dog, stuff like that. People are, people are reporting good success with that. You know, do your homework. There are a fair number of systems that are being fielded for um, uh, unmanned aerial systems, uninhabited aerial systems. Basically, that's mostly quadcopter at this point, although there's some, there's some increased use of fixed wing platforms for uh, longer range UAV stuff. Frankly, a lot of this stuff is going to uh, the higher frequency cell phone services as the 5G towers go in. Um, it seems like the robotic aircraft stuff seemed to be going there. 
And then um, we're really lucky that there's a, a fairly large community of rock tree specific um, tracking stuff available. Um, here's a couple of big red B transmitters that I've got. This is a 70 centimeter GPS enabled system. You can see, uh, and this, this is probably about 10 years old technology. So it's it's moderately large, but um, Greg is still selling those. It's still a good system. It's 70 centimeters, so it's got a fairly short antenna. This is one of his um, 70 centimeter um, radio direction finding transmitters. So this thing just beeps. And so you need a gain antenna to, um, to point and find where this is. Nice thing about this, um, if you can't decommutate the package, you can still RDF it, it still beeps. All right, so lots of options. Um, and so it's difficult to choose. And so what I thought I would do for this talk is I don't have time to talk about all the different options that are out there. So I picked three things to give you some concrete examples of, of what you could do. So the first one is I'm gonna talk about a, um, a, a telemetry expansion of the, um, of the Arduino altimeter project that Bruce and I um, presented last year at NARCON. And I use this to do the, um, the NAR rocket science challenge for sending telemetry. So you can read about that in the, um, the Make It Take It site, and I'll give you the URL to that later. And then um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the Altus Metrum um, a la carte system that you can um, pick components and you can put together. And then I'll talk about one of the ready to fly solutions. And I just say, you know, this isn't all of the stuff. There are lots of other options out there. Um, on my GPS website, I've got a spreadsheet that talks about the GPS enabled systems that I'm aware of. Let me know if there's there's one that I'm missing and I'll and I'll add it to that. So the roll your own thing, um, as, as I mentioned, this was a VNARCON uh, last year. It was a project to do a no solder build it yourself an altimeter that used um, the Arduino platform, which is a pretty common in the maker community computer system for installing your own software. This is the Estes Green Eggs rocket. Um, it's, it's actually using uh, a, a transparent um, payload bay from one of the other Estes rockets instead of the green payload bay that comes with the green eggs. But it's a 25 millimeter um, rocket. You can fly this thing with this GPS tracking system up to about 700 feet on a D12. And so it's a fun, low cost way of messing around with uh, GPS and telemetry systems and things for, uh, you know, four or five dollars a flight. These are These are pretty inexpensive. It uses a, uh, a a protocol called Stemma, and there's I'll show you a picture in a minute on how you can mix and match components um, to put it together. The uh, computer board that's on here has got Wi-Fi built onto it, and so it's easy, and you get that as uh, as the cost of of buying that computer board. Uh, the disadvantage is that the range isn't all that great. It's um it's a kilometer. They, they say a kilometer and a half, having two of these things talking together with the onboard antennas. Um, I'm For the ground segment, I'm using a directional antenna. I'll show that to you on the next slide. But um, if you're willing to do some of the work, and, and I'm publishing the software for this, so you don't have to write the software if you don't want to, but if you're, if you're willing to buy this thing and plug it together, um, the airborne segment is about $85. And uh, for about $150, and here's the slide. Um, so this is about $150. If you wanted to, you could get rid of this extra stuff and cut the price down to about $30. If you want to take this computer, this Ar uh, Arduino computer, to get um, telemetry directly from the airborne segment, and if you want to plug this into a laptop computer to get the data out, you can get rid of the display, you can get rid of the GPS, you can get rid of the inertial navigation system, which has got a compass on, on board, which I use to um, tell the user, you know, which direction this thing is pointing. You don't have to use this directional antenna. 
So you could get that cost down quite a bit if you if you were willing to use a laptop computer. I got tired of carrying my laptop computer around in the field because it's kind of annoying. Um, this is a standalone thing. It'll tell you um, range and bearing to the to the flight unit. Um, this fits in that BT65-2 of the, um, the Olympus is the transparent payload bay rocket. Um, uh, and you can put that onto the green eggs to get a really nice uh, 24 millimeter uh, rocket. Once again, the Arduino computer, it's got, a, um, it's got the Wi-Fi antenna built in right here. There's a battery on the back side of this that'll run it for a couple of hours. This is the Stemma cable. So you can basically mix and match sensors and displays. So if you didn't want this particular temperature, the temperature humidity um, pressure sensor that I picked, this BME 280, you could put a different one on there. Um, I've flown an inertial nav system on this. It'll give you, you know, acceleration and rotation rates and things like that. This is a little display that tells you if the system is, is running. This was what was used in the uh, standalone make it take it thing um, to, to get a readout of what the final altitude was once the thing came back to Earth. Uh, this is a cute little GPS receiver um, to supply all the GPS information and precise timing down to the transmitter. So an amazing system, no soldering involved in this. Uh, you need to cut out a, a little platform. This one's plywood. Some people are using basswood. Um, and then you can fly this in your rocket. And I think you can have a lot of fun for a couple of hundred bucks. All right, a, uh, a commercial a la carte system, um, uh, Altus Metrum, uh, this is nice. It's actually, it's a dual deploy altimeter that includes a GPS and uh, uh, a telemetry system built into it. You can see you need to add a battery that'll also um, fire your uh, initiators for doing the dual deploy events. You can see this is 70 centimeters. So you can see that antenna that's about six or seven inches long. Um, you do, it is a ham radio, so you need a ham radio license. That's pretty easy. Um, local amateur radio clubs will welcome you with open arms. They run training classes. They sponsor the exams. Taking the exam uh, costs about $15. And it's a 35 question multiple guess exam. It's just like the L2 high power exam and that all the questions are published beforehand. So it's pretty straightforward. You learn a lot of good radio stuff. This system um, has a, it, it's open source. So you can get their software and they've published the definition of their, uh, of their protocol that sends their telemetry down. You can also set this thing up to transmit APRS packets. So you can use that little handheld radio I showed in the previous slide if you want and, um, and get uh, APRS data straight onto your handheld radio if you want. They say it's good up to 25,000 feet. Uh, you need a laptop computer or an iOS device to look at the data on the ground and it shows maps. The, um, Airborne segment is about 300 bucks. So the telemetrum and a battery, about that. This um, is sort of a fancy ground segment, about $200, $230 for a directional antenna. So you can do direction finding with this if you can't decommutate packets. And then this is actually a little receiver that talks with Bluetooth to your laptop computer or your your iPhone or whatever, and will send uh, latitude, longitude, battery status, dual deploy status, all that stuff will get displayed and, and moving maps on your laptop or your iOS display. So pretty pretty cool system if you're, if you're willing to um, put some stuff together and, and do a little bit of mounting stuff. Um, they have an ecosystem, so they've got a fancier, a dual deploy um, altimeter that actually has um, uh, multiple things so you can do staging and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's fairly large and it does telemetry. This is on the smaller end. So this is their, their GPS transmitter only system. So if you think back to the 
10-year-old Big Red B system that I showed you, uh, there was also a quarter on that display. So this thing does uh, GPS telemetry. It's compatible with this ground station. And uh, you can put a nice large battery on there so it'll transmit for a day. Um, LabRat Rocketry has got a, a 3D printed slip for this. So you can just bolt this puppy in there, put the battery on the other side. It goes into this protective canister and you can just hang this off of uh, your recovery harness if you want. And it's as trivial as that to get this system into your rocket. All right. So um, I promised you a ready to fly system. Uh, Apogee Rockets came out last year with their simple GPS tracker. Um, it's a nice capable system with a, a, a multi-mile range. Um, pretty good price in, in about the same range as the Altus Metrum stuff. It's just a tracker that you can bolt into your rocket with this 9 volt battery. And then this ground station is nice. It'll, um, it's got a GPS receiver and a compass built in. So it'll tell you distance and direction to go to get your rocket. It's, it's just as simple as that. And of course, you know, it's Apogee Rockets. And so um, it, it's got excellent customer support and lots of videos out there to, um, uh, to, to help you get started with that. Okay, so GPS systems are really good, but you know, when you, when you get close, when you get down to the last 50 or 100 feet, um, you're going to need something else to get you actually to picking up your rocket, probably. And uh, so I strongly encourage you to, to use an audible beacon of some kind in your rocket. Uh, Pratt Hobbies has got this micro beacon. I've been using uh, Doug's stuff for ages. That's this one on the left. You put a little lens cell battery in there. Um, you, you put some masking tape across there and you masking tape it to your recovery harness. You cut a little piece of plastic and you, and you stick it in between the battery and the spring um, so that the thing doesn't turn on. And you put some tape across there. You take a little bit of a loop of your recovery harness. You tape that to the plastic. And that way, when the recovery harness straightens out, it pulls the the plastic out from between the spring and the battery and this puppy will turn on it'll start wailing and the light will start beeping transolve and, and um uh, the pratt hobbies website doesn't have these in stock you go to um apogee rockets and tim had a dozen when i looked a couple days ago um at, at this good price so uh it's not available at pratt-hobbies.com but uh uh Apogee's got it. Um, Transolve has got their unit. Um, I, I ordered one of these a few weeks ago. It came in just a couple of days. Uh, it's basically the same size. You can you can fit this thing inside a BT20 rocket if you want. Uh, this one might be a little bit bigger. You need to put some something there to attach it to your recovery harness. You could probably do the same trick with um, with a piece of plastic in there to uh, to and have it get um, turned on at deployment. It's also got an off on switch that the Pratt unit doesn't. For the uh, Hawking community, they um, make a really cool but somewhat expensive um, uh, beeper that's got a light on it that's probably about the size of that quarter. It's much smaller, but um, kind of more expensive. So I didn't bother putting a, a picture in there, but you can go to radiotracking.com and um, take a look at that. So, so for flight operations, you know, before flight, check your frequencies and make sure that somebody else isn't using your frequency, especially with the beeping stuff. It's incredibly embarrassing if it turns out that somebody else came up on your frequency and you started tracking their rocket and you lost track of your rocket. And make sure that your stuff is functioning before launch. So make sure, especially with these GPS systems, that the, um, the GPS usually takes a couple of minutes to warm up and, and start getting a navigation solution. Make sure you're getting a navigation solution from both your airborne and your ground segments before you actually fly. And um, make sure it looks reasonable. Record your telemetry during flight. There's no guarantee that when your rocket lands, you'll still be able to decommutate telemetry. And so um, 
uh, make sure that you that you somehow record your your ground station may tell you the last good packet that it decommutated, but there's no guarantee about that. And if you turn that off and then turn it back on again, you might lose that data. So make sure you record what that last good position was. Try and keep eyes on your rocket. Um, if you can see your rocket land, get a landmark on the horizon, write down what that is, know where you are, and that way you can always walk in a line to try and find your rocket. A lot of GPS apps on your cell phones will let you put in a compass bearing and it'll, um, it'll steer you left or right so that you can walk a line. And remember, um, you know, just because we can track rockets from 20 miles off, you, you still have a responsibility to land that rocket uh, on the field. You know, you don't want, especially the high power rockets, you don't want those coming down off fields. It's difficult enough to get um, uh, launch sites now without raining debris down on, uh, on the neighbors. And then when you're, um, when you're going out to pick up your rocket, recheck, make sure you're still getting data. I've a couple times had helpful people um, pick up my rocket and bring it back to the range head. And it saves some embarrassment, um, uh, you know, by knowing that the rocket is actually um, moving and being able to, uh, uh, to follow it. So that's good. Uh, I'll also mention tracking gives you another thing. When, if you uh, do lose the signal, keep track of um, how long it took to lose the signal. If, um, if you only heard the signal for two times the burn time of your motor, then that means you probably had some bad recovery event, right? And the rocket probably came in ballistic. Um, my condolences if that happened. Um, so uh, there's some interesting stuff to be had from, from telemetry just besides the, the latitude and longitude. And then I wanted to leave you with this slide. Um, if, you've, if you've got some money in your pocket, um, there are some high-end systems. Uh, you can see these, uh, these GPS, uh, tracking transmitters being used by the uh, by the Hawking community. This thing weighs nine grams. Um, that's four or five U.S. pennies. Uh, incredibly lightweight. Uh, batteries. Uh, you can get rechargeable batteries for these things. They'll last for um, a half a day or a day. Uh, this particular model from MarshallRadio.com does require an amateur radio license. It's um. Uh, about seven inches long, so you can you can tell that that's the 70 centimeter band. But um, amazing miniaturization stuff there. Okay, um, some references. Uh, if you go to this um, GPS page, I'm trying to keep that up to date, and underneath that is a link to a Google spreadsheet of the currently available uh, GPS systems. Here's the link to the uh, Make It Take It page about the Arduino project from last year. Um, I'm going to add this telemetry version um, to that as an appendix. I haven't done that yet. Um, you can go to the Altus Metrum site to find out about the Telemetrum if you want. And you can go to uh, apogeerockets.com and just look for GPS if you want. And it, you'll come up to the uh, simple GPS page. So let's say you want to do tracking, but it's too much or it's too expensive or whatever. Go to the American Radio Relay League, look up your local amateur radio club, volunteer to go and give a talk to them about hobby rocketry and possible interactions with amateur radio, and try and partner up with somebody who may already have all the equipment necessary to fly in your rocket. And you'll meet some new people. and um, and maybe they'll have the expertise um, to uh, help you accomplish your goals. And then feel free to send questions to me. Uh, will at uh, my call sign Kilo Whiskey for Whiskey Zelo um, um, if you have any questions. So I am going to get out of screen sharing mode here, I think. Um, and I am going to go over to the Q&A, I hope. Um, Steve uh, Medical asks, when where is the noise error introduced uh, to the civilian subset of GPS to not make it as precise as military grade? I think that that's done in the space segment, Steve. Um, uh, you'll want to 
uh, go over to Nav, Navstar, um, to the US military website that, where they talk about the constellation. And um, they've got some stuff in there about uh, selective availability. And um, so we'll say that that's answered. I take it Starlink is on the order of Iridium in altitude, um, Bob Kaplow asks. And um, yeah, it is basically Bob. So it's um, one of those constellations, they keep them low um, to try and keep the ground segment small. So it's an interesting take on, um, uh, on, on system optimization to try and keep the, the cost and size of the ground segment um, low. So it's, it's, it's interesting, but yeah, low altitude, that's why they need so many spacecraft um, to try and give um, complete uh, coverage. Um, let's see. And Bob says, I'm still sharing my desktop. So let me, I will stop sharing. Is that better? Now you get to see more of my face, sorry. Um, my condolences on that. Um, uh, Cooper says, I'm currently working on a custom tracking PCB that uses a cheap GPS module, a microcontroller, and a small HC12 radio that operates on 433 megahertz. Do you have any advice or comments on using this radio in this system? Um, sounds like an awesome project. Um, send me an email if you if you if you have questions or you have specific questions, um, I'd say go for it. You know, one of the great things about all this stuff that's available now is it's so easy to put together a little system that you can fly on a, um, a hobby style motor at, at basically any flying field to do some of these incredible projects. So keep at it, keep going. Um, and uh, Ben Cook says, with communication specialists shutting down, yeah, um, uh, they were doing the, the 222 megahertz system, I believe. Um, um, what other lightweight, compact, low power transmitters are available that are similar in function and are compatible with ComSpec receivers? Could you DIY a ComSpec compatible transmitter? Ben Cook asks. So, um, so yes, um, if you're an amateur radio operator, um, you can totally do your own transmitter um, in, the, in those frequency bands. It would be um, a science fair project. It would be a challenge. One of the things that the ComSpec people did to try and make it um, fit into the 220 megahertz band was they did uh, an incredibly narrow bandwidth signal. And so you need to try and replicate that. Um, uh, Walston isn't around anymore. Um, Big Red B makes a direction finding system that's pretty small, but not as small as the, well, and it's, it's probably the, about the same size as the communication specialist system. So you should look at Big Red B. Um, and then there are, um, there are some wildlife tracking systems and you can look at those URLs earlier in the talk. I will, um, I'll go ahead and I'll, um, I'll post these slides up so that you can get to those URLs. Um, but, uh, that's probably the place for you to look for the, for the smallest stuff that's still compatible with the Walston. Maybe not the communication specialist stuff because I don't think that any of the wildlife people are um, are doing stuff in that uh, 1.25 megahertz, uh, 1.25 meter, you know, 220 megahertz band thing. So send me an email if if that didn't answer your question. Um, and we're just about the end of the hour. I'll I'll hang out here some more folks, but. Um, uh, you'll probably want to get off to some other um, to some other chats. Um, 
and thanks for coming. Hope that was interesting. Look forward to seeing some of you folks on the flying field. And have fun at the rest of Narcon. Okay, I'm I'm gonna end the broadcast. See you around. Bye bye.